latest in tech and accessibility. This is Access Tech Live with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. We're back on Access Tech Live, Stephen Scott in Glasgow, Scotland. Mark Aflalo here in beautiful Montreal. I feel like the weather is turning for all of us, so uh, hopefully so, uh, you're somewhere warm. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome our guest this week. She is the Senior Xbox Game Studios Accessibility Lead. She's also the co-director of the Game Accessibility Conference. Tara Volker, thank you so much for being with us this week. No, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm also joined by uh, another accessibility specialist, uh, Leon the Cat. Um, oh, and I so like he's Leon. also, yeah, he's going to be here to answer questions as well. Isn't that true, Leon? Yeah. I'm sure he's a great interview. <laughs> I'm sure you have many a conversation <laughs> when, you, when you're quiet. I also noticed the cat ear is on your headset, which is pretty cool oh, as well. He's, so, uh, he's literally turning off my camera. Okay. Sorry, you don't have to be so good about is, it. This is why we do this show live, Tara. It's so that you can you can try to push us to our limits and see if there's ever a breaking point, and we're not going to get to that. I promise you. Uh, th you know, thank you so much for being with us. Um, uh, you're going to be with us for a while today. I appreciate that. And before we dive into the news, I got to ask you because that title on your business card not only is it a long one, I'm sure. I, I got to know what it's about and what you do on a day to day, not only with obviously on the Xbox side, but also on the game accessibility conference because your world is definitely way more fun than mine uh first off uh your world is also very very fun so don't put yourself down like that uh <laughs> but yeah it it, it 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 is a lot and it's a very long title so within the world of gaming at microsoft at xbox one of our uh, business units is the xbox game studios and that is all of the different independent studios who make all of our video games they get published under um, Xbox. And so I work with all of those studios to help them make their games as accessible as they can be. And so it's learning, it's teaching, it's consulting, it's running a champs program, a little bit of everything. And I'm really lucky because uh, I get to work with some really amazing teams. But when I'm not doing that, yeah, I'm the co-director of the Game Accessibility Conference. And that is a conference that happens twice a year, once in the US, once in the UK, fully dedicated to just teaching devs about accessibility and disability in the video game space. And that's, you know, the putting together a whole event, which, you know, you run a TV show, you understand how hard this is. <laughs> <laughs> Tara, hi, it's Stephen here. And I just wanted to ask you about your feelings about uh, other companies like Sony, because of course we've been hearing a lot about adaptive controllers, uh, Sony, Xbox, of course, very similar uh, what Sony's bringing out to uh, what Microsoft did over a year ago. What's your take on that? And what's your feelings about that That level of development we're seeing uh, bringing in accessibility into more games companies, into more companies generally releasing games? I think it's absolutely amazing. One of the things I love about the controller that Sony is releasing, which I have pre-ordered because I want to check it out and I want to play with it, <laughs> is that it's not the exact same as we built the adaptive controller. We have always talked about, hey, this was our go but it's not perfect and you know we want to continue our accessibility journey and it's great to see another company building a controller that's trying to reach the same goal of you know inclusion of people with mobility disabilities and you know they they solved it in a different way so now there's so much that we can learn from each other but it also means there's more choice for consumers and you know when you get to make a choice and pick the product that works best for you that's when you're going to have the best experience. So like, I want more of these controllers because there was also um, the uh, Nintendo released one that uh, came out, uh, I think via Hori. So it's not quite the same, but the fact that, you know, there are now multiple controllers that you'll be able to choose from, uh, I think is amazing. Because if you would have asked me, you know, five, six years ago, like, oh, do you think there'll be multiple accessibility controllers available? Like, I probably would have laughed at you. Like, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> so this is fantastic, and I want more. No, absolutely. I, I think, though, it's, it's often good at this point, especially with you here, Tara, to kind of stop and take stock a little bit. So for people who don't live and breathe gaming, and I'm one of those people, to be perfectly honest, and there are reasons for that, and we'll get into that later, but I want you to tell us, if you can, where we're at at the moment with accessible gaming in 2023? Right now, we are at this sort of watershed moment. We are seeing more accessibility for more companies in more games at a higher level of investment 
that we've ever seen before. So we are on a peak of exponential growth in the industry. And I'm saying here today, wow, there's so much accessibility that didn't exist even a couple of years ago. I'm sure that I'll say the exact same thing, like two years from now, oh my goodness, there's so much accessibility today that didn't happen a couple of years ago. We're seeing new hardware. We're seeing new options in game. We're seeing uh, even just gaming events being more physically accessible to gamers with disabilities. And all of this is you know, still relatively new as a phenomenon. Well, why do you think it is that it's moving so fast in this particular area? Because if you look at everything else in the world and you look at whether it's consumer hardware or just the world in in, uh, in general, it seems like it it's always little baby steps and we're always having to force the subject. But gaming, at least in my perspective, and I'm kind of with Steven where I'm not a hardcore gamer, but my son is, um, the amount of stuff we're hearing about accessibility in gaming, whether it's the gameplay, whether it's people like Steve Saylor, or um, just it's it's in our face more and more, which is phenomenal. But why so fast? Because it's it feels like it's taken decades to even bring up this conversation. What's changed? I think the biggest thing is that game developers are trying to create experiences for everyone to enjoy. Game developers are creating, you know, not just entertainment, but really art in sort of a way. And we want everyone to be able to play our games. We want everyone to, you know, get to have that narrative, that experience. And I think because we are so connected to our consumer base, because we are also frequently our consumer base, that we have much larger empathy for other players in our in in our products and so we want to engage and i think the other thing that also is starting to happen is you know some of the earliest game devs like they're starting to they're starting to age you know maybe they're starting to get some arthritis maybe they themselves don't have the dexterity they used to have when they first started making games and so i think there's also a bit of like future protection happening i think a lot of game devs are like oh man as i grow older i want to continue playing so we need to invest in accessibility now so that as i age i can continue to game um you know you work with the game studios with pretty i mean with a lot of them if not all of them uh, have they been receptive to accessibility in gaming is it something that they're they're feeling they have to like kind of go back and and figure out how to make it happen or is it like you know i use microsoft as an example you know it's in the dna now it's it's from the start accessibility is an issue and they make sure they're building with accessibility in mind is gaming is that industry the same now I would say that as an industry as a whole, we're getting a lot better about being aware of accessibility, but there are definitely people who are in different stages of their accessibility journey. So there are some studios, you know, Turn 10, Naughty Dog, um, some of the ones in Ubisoft who do have it built into their, their DNA. There are other studios who are just starting and they're still kind of in the retrofitting phase. Like, they have made a game and realized that it has gaps in terms of accessibility. So they're trying to go back in and patch it, which is you know going to still result in a more accessible game, but not the level of accessibility we see from some titles across the industry today. But overall, like I don't think there is any game development team out there who's like sitting there being like, oh, I don't want disabled players to play my game. Like I don't <laughs> want to invest in accessibility. Like I don't think that's a thing. Uh, I think that if there are studios who are doing less accessible work, it's normally that they're just earlier in their accessibility journey and they're trying to understand the problem. You know, accessibility challenges in a title are really just a problem to be solved. And normally if the problem isn't being solved in those titles, it's just that they don't fully understand the problem space yet. You know, I think back to my own experience, Tara, and, you know, as someone who has gone blind over time, uh, you know, losing vision and enjoying games like Sonic the Hedgehog and, you know, the early Grand Theft Autos back in the day and now being unable to play games, I feel that there's perhaps maybe a little bit of a disconnect in the community between those people who may want to find their way back in. Do you think maybe what needs to be done on that to, to sort of bring players like myself, like others who have gone away from gaming, who maybe feel that it's just too much to learn, too too much, and, and also how much is available to me as a blind gamer, for example? Yeah, so that's a challenge that we actually have around all different areas of disability. Like even as someone who gets like motion sick, today's games make me much more motion sick than the old school games, right? So as mm. technology has, has advanced, we've gotten new problems in terms of accessibility. 
there are gamers like you who gained and then kind of fell out during that period of time where accessibility wasn't a priority for the industry. And games really did advance rapidly during that time. It's honestly a challenge we even see with, um, you know, Forza uh, Motorsport that just came out and Blind Driving Assist. It is a lot to learn. Um, and so what we've been trying to do, um, and I've seen other studios do as well, is partner with people who are high um, high profile influencers in the gaming space to translate that lived experience to try to help everyone get ramped up and understand, like create additional tutorials and help people get ramped up to figure it out. Cause yeah, exactly. Like you said, you know, it's, you know, Sonic is very different than some of the games that we'll see today, or even the newest Sonics that come out, right? Like those are 3d games. And so there is definitely a learning barrier, but it's actually a problem that the entire industry has, even outside the space of accessibility, that games can be really intimidating. Like my mom was a huge gamer um, on the NES and she doesn't really game anymore because she's just very uh, you know, overwhelmed by the sheer amount of buttons that exist on a controller now, right? So it's definitely an industry-wide problem regardless of if you have a disability or not. I'm definitely overwhelmed by buttons on the controller too. Tyra, <laughs> stick around. Um, we're we're going to take a quick break. Uh, and I want you to get your mind working on our question of the week, which is what is your favorite classic video game? And it could be anything, whether it's console, mobile, anything. We're going to get to your answer a bit later, along with about like 40 others that are going online. So let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're also going to be welcomed by another guest, Mark Barley, uh, who's the founder of Able Gamers. He's going to talk about their organization uh, and more with Tara coming up here on Access Tech Live. We want to hear from you. Follow us on social media and get involved at Access Tech Live. We'll be right back. The latest in tech and accessibility. This is Access Tech Live with Stephen Scott and Marco Flalo. Welcome back. I am Stephen Scott. Marco Flalo is with me. Also, our guest this week is the senior Xbox Game Studios accessibility lead. She's also the co-director of the Game Accessibility Conference. Tara Volker is uh, back with us. Great to have you back here, Tara, along with your cats as well. Yes. <laughs> um, must, must mention the cats. Um, now, look, we mentioned Forza earlier, and just last week, of course, Forza Motorsports was released, and we featured here on the show our mutual friend Steve Saylor and his reaction to playing the game and winning a race. I want to ask you, though, Tara, what kind of work and I can only imagine the amount, but what kind of work goes into making a game like Forza, a driving game, playable by someone who can't see? Honestly, the biggest part of the work is the partnership with people who cannot see or don't see well to make sure that we're figuring out their needs. Um, you know, I, I talked before about you have to understand the problem to solve it. And for us, it was a, a really fun challenge because obviously the people we're trying to unlock a racing simulation experience for were people who uh, can't race cars in, in real life. So that was a fun challenge. But for us, it was a lot of rounds of feedback. We knew it was gonna have to be audio based. And we actually took a lot of learnings from other uh, racing, uh, even real life events that take place. Like, you know, in the game now there is uh, a voice who will tell you what type of turn is coming up. Is it right? Is it left? How sharp is the turn? And, you know, that was partially inspired by rally car drivers because they will have a co-pilot who is telling them what is coming up so that they can prepare. So, you know, it's pulling in, you know, things from real life we can be inspired by. It's hearing from people with disabilities what they need. And then, you know, once you get the idea, once you get as what we uh, lovingly refer to as the beeps and boops, going in game, just going through those those rounds of feedback and seeing if it works. And if it doesn't work, being okay and prepared to go back to the drawing board and make changes. Was there a point at all in that development where you weren't even sure if it was going to work, if it was going to become accessible? And you, you talk about the beeps and boops and going back to the drawing board, but I can imagine that there's a point in time when you're trying to develop this that you're just not sure. Was there ever a point where you said, this just may not happen? I think at the very beginning, like we we had the goal. So if you go back uh, in, in 2019, um, one of the lead designers of Forza, he actually gave a talk at the Game Accessibility Conference. And there's a slide about future goals. And one of them was to become blind accessible. 
but we we literally had no idea how. So at that point, we were like, this may not actually happen, but we're hoping by willing that goal, saying that goal publicly, maybe, you know, it will make ourselves make it happen. But, you know, we had ideas. And once we kind of got our first round of ideas and we got those first rounds of feedback, I think once we saw it, we didn't think, oh, this can't happen. We just thought, oh, we're close, but this isn't it. And I think there was a lot of, oh, we're close, but this isn't it. Oh, we're close, but this isn't it. And then going through that iteration. But I think once we got our first kind of demo actually in front of someone, we're like, okay, we can do this. We we didn't know how long it would take. <laughs> we didn't know if it would, you know, be ready for when this game launched when we started, but we we knew we would get there eventually. So we we were determined. Yeah, uh, no pun intended here, but I want to shift gears for a second uh, and talk about oh, uh, talk about gaming in the cloud because you know we see on one hand things and services like Xbox Cloud Gaming uh, gaining incredible momentum. It's coming to the new MetaQuest 3 soon. Um, uh, you look at devices like Apple's iPhone taking a really big gaming focus on stage, at, you know, keynotes and stuff like that. But then on the other hand, you look at services like Google Stadia, which is basically shut down, which is not terribly surprising from Google because they tend to try things and just kind of shelve them. So is there a clear path towards a future where we're not going to have a console anymore? I think if you, so I don't know, and I and I want to be like fully transparent. I'm not yeah. on the part of Xbox that would know. So this is literally me being like, hmm, hmm. This is why you're here. I, we want your opinion I, too, you know. <laughs> I, so for me, there's been, I I have got to see really cool stuff happening in cloud gaming for, for years. So before um, I worked at Xbox, like I actually worked at PlayStation on their cloud streaming service, uh, PlayStation Now. And the tech that is in all of these game streaming services, whether it's Xbox, PlayStation, you know, whoever else, they are so cool. And it's, I feel like there's such great opportunities because hardware can be so expensive. And I don't know if we're there yet, but if I think all of the major companies continue to make these sort of investments, like I don't see why we could... Like to me, it's like a, an accessibility issue. Like hardware is expensive and like people with disabilities already have enough problems, particularly in the US with our healthcare system and how our disability uh, you know, program works in the US. Like they already have enough problems <laughs> in terms of finances. So like figuring out how we could remove the console as a barrier to gaming and utilizing things you already have, like, you know, is, is fantastic. I mean, and even if you look at stuff like you know, um, like xCloud from, from Xbox, like you can right now, you know, already stream games on your, your PC and, you know, there's the ability to stream things to, to phones and everything. So like, I think, I think we're already getting there and I think we just have to to be patient and let the, the tech catch up. Um, but honestly, I, I actually think the biggest barrier isn't going to be, um, the tech coming from the companies. I think it's going to be infrastructure in the world. Like I grew up in a really, really rural area. Um, and even um, like when I go and visit my brother, like it, it struggles because like their infrastructure hasn't been upgraded. So I actually think like, I I think there will always be hardware consoles because there are literally just areas where the infrastructure is not good enough for cloud gaming. And I have no idea if I actually answered your question in there, if I just had a ramble about <laughs> cloud gaming. <laughs> Uh, Tara, I want to take you back a couple of weeks because you hosted the 2023 Game Accessibility Conference, the GA Conf. What were some of your highlights? Oh, honestly, the thing I, I love most about the conference is I get to learn from other teams and how they are doing work, which means I can, um, you know, borrow their ideas and, and put them into my own job. Some of the talks I thought were absolutely amazing. Um, first off, EA, um, they had two speakers come and talk about Dead Space. And for me, I love horror games, um, but I'm also someone who um, has PTSD and PTSD and other mental health conditions are um, new areas in terms of accessibility in video games. Like there are essentially blockers for, for us as well. And I absolutely loved how EA talked about all of the work that they did to put in gore mitigation, to put in trigger warnings, um, but actually have them implemented in games. Like if you didn't want to see, you know, the alien being ripped apart or whatever, like they literally, you don't have to, because that's not 
you know, it's a part of the game, but there's so much more to Dead Space. So I absolutely loved that they did a talk about that. And honestly, one of the other talks I absolutely loved, um, Ubisoft, uh, one of their uh, communication leads, Jessica, she came and talked about Ubisoft's communication plan in terms of accessibility, and they are industry mm-hmm. leading. So they, you know, it's super, super important to get accessibility information out as early as possible so players can make informed choices. And literally earlier this year with uh, one of the new Prince of Persia game announces, they got the accessibility information out for the game the day of the project announced, like seven months ahead of launch, which is like unheard of. It's amazing. Um, So Ubisoft was able to come and talk about how they did that, the program they have in place and how they facilitate getting accessibility information out to their players. And like, I was just absolutely amazed. Um, uh, And then my my final one, because I'm going to plug one more. There was a game, um, uh, Another Crab's Treasure, which is an indie developer, a small team that's actually based out of the Seattle area. Um, and they gave a talk about, uh, you can give the, the character, uh, who's a crab, a gun, um, that does like one hit kills. And they were just like, you know, sometimes you just need to have fun and that's okay. And accessibility. So there was a 15 minute mic, uh, micro talk on, um, giving players fun by adding a gun. Um, and it was, <laughs> I don't, it was hysterical, wow. uh, but accessible. It was amazing. I could, like, we could have made the whole show about this because I could, yeah. literally could hype up <laughs> any of the talks by any of the people at the conference. They were amazing. It is incredible. Tara, it has been so much fun having you here today. Uh, thank you so much for being with us on Access Tech Live. But wait, before no, before it, you go, Tara, I got to ask you your answer to the question of the day, which is uh, what yeah. your favorite classic video game is. And it could be anything, console, mobile, you name it. What is it? So my favorite, favorite, favorite classic game is the original Zelda on uh, the Super Nintendo. So for me, it was, it's the first game I I ever beat and it's what kicked off my love of gaming. I even have like a Zelda Triforce tattoo on my wrist and like it, you know, I'm still playing Zelda games. And so like, it'll just always have a special special place in my heart and my mom beat it too my mom was also super into zelda so there's also like some daughter mommy gaming action so i think that's also why it has like a special place in my heart all right if people want to follow you where can they where can they do that they can find me on the platform formerly known as twitter uh, lady <laughs> O'Pair, l-a-t-i-e-a-u-p-a-i-r Tara Volker, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We're going to have you on again. We'll spend a whole time just talking about the game conference, I I promise you, uh, in the future. Uh, And you guys at home, uh, what's your answer to the question? We're going to get to those in just a second right here on Access Deck Live. We want to hear from you. Follow us on social media and get involved at Access Deck Live. We'll be right back. 